Okay, we will start. Just give me one second. Okay, we'll start. We'll start in a second, folks. I'm just gonna just check something out. Yeah. All right. Good. <clears throat> so, so tonight we're going to speak about uh, Jacob's "I Have a Dream" moment, <laughs> which um, I know I'm stealing the title from. Um, somebody else, but who is that? Martin Luther King, right? I have a dream. <laughs> In any event, this is Kabbalah Decoded, and we will talk about Jacob's dream tonight um, and his dream moment, his special. Um, now, he wasn't the only one that had dreams, obviously. Pharaoh also had a dream, but <laughs> Junior, right? Yeah. Uh, Pharaoh also had a dream. So let me make sure I'm recording here. Yeah. Um, Pharaoh also had a dream, but the difference between uh, Jacob and Pharaoh is that when um, when Pharaoh had his dream, it says, and he went back to sleep. <laughs> Whereas um, Jacob, when he had a dream, uh, he woke up and he um, he was fully awake and he sort of, recalled the dream and he, he wanted to go forward and wanted to march forward. Okay, let's just discuss what's going on over here. <clears throat> First of all, Jacob is basically, Yaakov is fleeing from his brother Esau, Esau. <clears throat> um, his parents have told him, his mother in particular told him, uh, you better scram because he's um, going to kill you. Very upset about the fact that Jacob took the blessings that Yitzchak Isaac, his father, had apparently intended for Esau. Esau was the firstborn. And at his mother's behest, Jacob went in and took the blessings. And the truth is, he did that not willingly, but uh, because his mother had told him to do so. But nevertheless, he did it. <clears throat> and historically, we see that um, that was actually to Esau's benefit, Esau's benefit, because had he received the blessings, they would have destroyed him. He was not capable of, of um, carrying out the work of the firstborn, which was the spiritual heritage of his father. So he wasn't capable of that. In any event, Jacob is fleeing. Yaakov is fleeing from, uh, from Esau, and he is accosted by Esau's son, Eliphaz, who has been told by his father to find Jacob and kill him. This is not told in the Torah, this is told by the rabbis. Eliphaz actually catches up to Jacob, to Yaakov, and he says to him, my father told me to kill you, but since I grew up in the house of Abraham, of Abraham, I can't do such a thing. Tell me what I should do in order to make my father's wishes, to fulfill my father's wishes, as well as uh, not kill, which is something that is anathema to the house of Abraham and Isaac and so on. So Jacob said, take everything that I own, take all my wealth, take everything, because um, there's a Talmudic statement Obviously, the Talmud wasn't written yet, but the, the, the same place that the Talmud learns it is from, it's, a, it's kind of an obvious thing, a poor person, a poor a destitute person is regarded almost as dead. So you can say to your father that since you took everything that I own, you, as if you, it's as if you killed me. So, Jacob is now destitute, has absolutely nothing except the clothes that he's wearing and a stick. And uh, 
uh, he is about to leave the Holy Land on his way to the unholy land where Lavan lives. We spoke about this on Sunday. He is off to his uh, to his uncle's house, and his uncle is known as a con man, a thief, a con man, a liar, um, and extremely deceptive. In any event, um, he's just about to um, he's just about to leave the land of Israel when suddenly darkness descends. And um, he's stuck in a certain place where he goes to sleep for the night. Now, the expression that's used in the Torah is Vayivga Bamakomahu. Vayivga means he happened upon suddenly. The sages also explain that the word for the word happen upon by Yivka is also one of the expressions of prayer. There's several expressions of prayer. That's one of them. By Yivka is to pray. So they say that Jacob, Yaakov established the evening prayer. Abraham established the morning prayer by Yashkem, Abraham, Baboker. Abraham arose early, the sages explained, to pray the morning prayers. Isaac Yitzhak established the afternoon prayer. Vayetza Yitzhak lasuach basodel if not erev. Jacob, uh, sorry, Isaac went out into the field towards evening to lasuach, to, to also to pray, to meditate and to pray. And now Jacob establishes the evening prayer. Now the truth is these prayers Vayivga, oh, so you want me to spell it? Uh, Vayivga. Vayivga. There you go. Vayivga. Or in Hebrew, if you want, Vayiv, Vayivga. Nope. Sorry. Vayivga. Okay? Okay, so, um, so Jacob goes off to, um, he establishes the evening prayer. Now, not only do they pray at the welcome, not only do they pray uh, privately, um, not, only do they, not only do they pray each at a different time, but the nature of the prayer is different. The nature of the prayer is different. That's one of the things that we're going to sort of discuss tonight. When Abraham uh, prays, so it says, Vayashkem Abraham Baboke, he arose early in the morning. We're talking about prayer at a time of light. Prayer at a time of morning. Now, it's not only morning in the sense of time, but it's also morning in the sense that the light is coming into the world. The Zohar calls it Safra the Abraham, the morning of Abraham, of Abraham. Abraham is also called Abraham HaEzrahi, which uh, some people translate as Abraham the citizen, but the sages explain that it means Abraham from whom, or in whose time, the light began to shine. So Abraham represents that type of prayer that is said at the time that the light is shining and growing stronger. Isaac, Yitzchak, uh, establishes the afternoon prayer. And the afternoon prayer is anywhere from, uh, from about a half hour after midday when it's clearly recognizable that the sun is no longer at its zenith, uh, that it's moved towards the west. Uh, until evening, until the stars come out, or um, preferably before sun, by sunset one should pray, but at least until the stars come out. That's also a time of light, and not only is it a time of light, but it's also a time when the whole day has been... Um, hmm, what just happened there? I don't know. <laughs> but, um, all right. In any event, um, so 
when the light has been um, growing for the entire day, and now the light is turning towards evening, but it's still daylight, it's still, it's still daytime. But Jacob prays at a time when it's dark. He prays in the night. Different kind of a prayer when you pray in the light or when you pray in the dark. Now, just imagine the situation here. Jacob is in a situation where he is fearful for his life. He's just he's fleeing his brother. He's going to unknown, an unknown place where there's rumors that his uncle, who's the only person that he knows there, is not the nicest of people. Um, he's lost all of his wealth, anything that he owned was taken by Eliphaz. He has absolutely nothing with him other than a stick and the clothing that he's wearing. And he's about to leave the Holy Land. Not a very pleasant situation to be in. This is symbolic, say the sages, of his descendants who at times had to suddenly leave the place where they were for fear of murder, fear of uh, pogrom, and flee to unknown parts in order to, in order to survive. So Jacob represents, therefore, that time of going into the darkness, going into the fearsome darkness. But he nevertheless represents, as we'll see in a moment, something that transcends even the morning of, of, of Abraham and the afternoon of Isaac. Each of these three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, represents one of the three temples. As far as Abraham is concerned, the temple is referred to when talking about the place where he sacrificed, where he took Isaac to be sacrificed, although he wasn't sacrificed in the end. He calls it higher, the mountain, the mountain, Mount Moriah, the mountain of Moriah. Now, a mountain is generally a place where most people don't live. Uh, a mountain is maybe a fortress. Maybe there's a fortress over there, but maybe it's just like a mountain that forms some kind of a barrier, and it's very lofty and high and perhaps beautiful to look at, uh, but to ascend it needs tremendous effort, and so on. But nevertheless, it's sturdy, and it's uh, solid, so the temple, in the place of the temple, the place where the temple later stood, is also called Har Hamoria, the mountain of Mar Mount Moriah. Or actually the word Moriah, Moriah in Hebrew, um, our, our sages in the Kabbalah tells us that the word Moriah comes from the word to, to show, to teach. Hora'ah, the mountain of teaching. So from the first temple came out some of the essential teachings of Judaism, the Jewish people. The second temple, which is represented by Isaac, is called Vayetza Yitzhak Lasuach Basadi. He goes out to meditate and to pray in the field. So the field represents also, it was the same place that he went to, it was the same place, also the place that the temple was built. It was, called a, it was called a field by him. The difference between a field and a mountain is a mountain is, as I said before, sort of a desolate, very strong and sturdy place. And it is a mountain from which instruction and teaching and, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, instruction and teaching come. But a field is a much more fruitful thing. It's a place where things grow. It's a place where you plant. It's a place where you have work to do. A mountain, you just have to either climb and then climb down, or you have to sort of go around it. But a field is a place of work. That represents also the second, the time of the second temple was a, was a time when 
there was a tremendous amount of work being done in order, so to speak, to cultivate the world as a more fitting place for godliness. But it's the third temple which has not yet been built, which will be built in the future, which represents Jacob. And that is called, um, that is called Beit El. That's the place where he is. It's the same place as the field where Isaac prayed, and the same place as Mount Moriah. It's exactly the same place, the place where the third Beit temple will stand. But that's called Beit El. It's called a bait. It's called a house. So from a mountain to a field to a house. A house is a place where you're at home. That's where you live. That's where you can be yourself. That's where your uh, man's home is his castle, I think the, the British say. Is that right? His home is his castle. Right. So in any event, Jacob... At this particular point in time, I'll talk more in a minute about, about the temple and what it represents. Um, Jacob, at this particular time, he prays the evening prayer, and then he lies down to sleep. When he lies down to sleep, he takes stones and he puts them, according to some straightforward commentaries, they say he just puts them under his head. He doesn't have anything else to put under his head. He owned nothing except the clothes that he was wearing. So he put a stone for his, uh, under his head. Others say he put stones around him to protect himself. There's also an explanation, a Kabbalistic explanation, that the stones are actually letters. According to the Sefer Yetzirah, the, he put 12 stones around his head. These represent the 12 permutations of the name of the ineffable name of God, the name which is written with the four letters, yud Hey, vav Hey. So those letters form 12 permutations. That's what he put around his head because he knew that he was going into the night, into the exile. He was going out of the Holy Land and he would need that protection that he would have to place around his head. In other words, he would have to keep his consciousness in godliness and he played therefore he placed around his head these stones these permutations of the name of god in other words he meditated on these permutations he sort of absorbed them he placed them beneath his head means that they sort of lifted up his head while he was asleep okay so he goes to sleep and he has a dream and in his dream, he sees angels ascending and descending a ladder. The ladder, the foot of the ladder is down on earth. And the head of the ladder, the top of the ladder is up in heaven. Again, the Zohar says that that ladder represents, in itself represents prayer. Because prayer is a, it's like a ladder, it has various rungs has various stages, there's various stages in prayer, but from the very bottom, one can climb up step after step after step after step until the head reaches heaven. Now, there are those interpretations that say it's not just the head of the ladder which reaches heaven, it's the head of the person which reaches heaven. So he dreams and there's a ladder and his feet are on the ground. Not the ladder's feet are on the ground, but his feet are on the ground. Yet his head is in heaven. This is a message to Jacob, to Yaakov. Keep your feet on the ground. Keep grounded. But have your thoughts in heavenly matters. Keep your feet firmly planted on the ground while your head is preoccupied with holy matters. In fact, there's a verse that says, and God will bless you in everything that you do. So, the blessing that comes from God is when you do, when your hands and your feet are occupied, so to speak, with making a living. But your head is occupied with other things. Your head is occupied, your head and your heart are occupied with godliness and good deeds, helping out other people. 
In any event, he dreams and he sees angels rising and coming down, going up the ladder and coming down the ladder. So the, uh, the, the sages explain, the sages of the Kabbalah explain that these angels that he saw going up the ladder and the angels that he saw coming, coming down the ladder were two different angels, two different sets. One was the set of angels that results from a person doing good things in this world, doing good deeds in this world that creates a, an angel, a good angel, so to speak. And someone who does uh, evil deeds creates the opposite. And these are these, these are real things. They're not actually, um, you know, the way they're always depicted by artists. Obviously, <laughs> it's kind of childish, and you know, all these sort of um, um, creatures wearing some kind of a uh, flimsy curtain and with uh, you know with wings. I mean. That's <laughs> That's not really what we mean. Uh, an angel, a malach, the word angel in, in Hebrew um, really means a messenger. So when a person dreams, when a person is dreaming, he's dreaming, um, and when Jacob was dreaming rather, when he's dreaming of these angels, he's recalling or he's seeing the effect of his positive actions, good deeds, ascending to a higher level. So those are the angels which are going up. Now the angels that are coming down are the angels that are sent to protect him. That's called, in some uh, Kabbalistic works, that's called the Shefa, the outflow from above that protects a person and guides him in the right way to go and do the right things and to advance in his spiritual quest. So Jacob has a dream. And the dream is that his good deeds are ascending and the protection is descending from above. And then he sees, he sees God. Now, um, it's obvious that um, when we say that he sees God, we're not talking about um, with his physical eyes. It was an experience. He experiences God at the top of the ladder. And God promises to him protection and um, basically that he will return to this place. And that this place will be the place of the third, the place of the third temple. Now, what's important about this dream that he has, the word halom, the word dream in Hebrew, uh, just let me write it here. Um, halom, right? Halom. Or in Hebrew, it would be Halom. Right, so the word dream itself is from the same word as healing. Hachlama. Healing in the sense of re being restored to health. Being restored to health. Now, why is this important? What's the significance over here? Basically, the dream that Jacob is having He's dreaming about the future, but he's also dreaming about what is going to bring him back to a state, what is going to keep him rather, what is going to keep him in a state of health, what's going to restore him to his, don't forget he was desperately poor at this particular time, what's going to restore him to a state of, uh, of feeling confidence to a state of feeling that he's doing the right thing, to a state that he, of, of, um, of, of, of certainty that he's on the right path. And that very often is what a dream is about. When we dream, there's really two aspects 
there are really two aspects of dream. One aspect of dream is, as explained in Kabbalah, one aspect of dream is to purify the events of the day. Sort of the purification of the day, the mind runs through at night during dreams, which we're not even always aware of, but the mind um, gathers together all the bits of information that we've absorbed some of it consciously, a far vaster quantity of it unconsciously, and puts it in generally, hopefully, the proper perspective. Stores it away together with other bits of information that happen to the person through the day and relives them in a certain sequence which kind of puts them to rest. Let's put it that way. So that's the purification aspect of dreams. But there's another aspect of dream, which is essentially an idea of prophecy, or as probably it would be more correct to say, divine inspiration. So there's the clarification aspect of dream, and then the, the prophetic or the inspirational aspect of a dream. Jacob's dream over here, the one that he tells us, and dreams, by the way, are very significant. We see throughout the Torah, Joseph had a dream. Various, uh, we, we see there's a, there's a lot of occasions of, uh, of dreaming. But in any event, the dream that he has here turns out to be essentially a prophetic dream. It's a dream about his future. Not only his future, but the future of his children. The future of his descendants. The future of the Jewish people as a whole, which essentially stems from whom we called the Israelites, or Bnei Israel, the sons of Israel. Israel was the name that Jacob got later on when he wrestled with the angel of Esau, of Asaph. Now, In terms of Kabbalah, the dream that he had, being a prophetic dream, had to do with the nature of, essentially the nature of the third temple. When he wakes up in the morning, when he wakes up in the morning, he, um, he says the following, Ma makom hazeh, how awesome is this place? It's filled with awe, and enze kim kim shamayim, this is the house of God, this is the gate of heaven. This is the gate of heaven. Now, when he speaks about the gate of heaven, what does he mean? The gate, as we, all, as, we, uh, as we know, is the gate serves to mark a, um, a transition point, let's call it a transition point between one state and another. Now, the state that he was going to was unknown. He was going outside of the land, of, outside of the Holy Land. And yet it says that this is the gate of heaven. Now, what, what did he mean that this is the gate of heaven? Does it mean that the gate of heaven is in that place? And he is about to leave that place only when he comes back many, many years later. Only when he comes back many years later, uh, according to the straightforward uh, explanation of the Torah, it's more than 20 years later, 22 years later, according to the rabbinic explanation, it's actually 36 years later he comes back because he spent 14 years uh, studying two years on the road and 20 years with, uh, with Laban, with Lavan. 
But in any event, is the gate here so that when he goes, he has to come back to the gate? Or when he says, this is the gate of heaven, is he going through the gate into heaven, so to speak, and therefore taking his entire existence with him? He's taking, in, in a sense, he's taking the temple with him. He's going, he's walking to the gate of heaven. Now, I would like to suggest that the latter is really the proper interpretation. Let me take it a step, uh, one step back. When Jacob and Esau, both of them, went into Isaac to get the blessings, when Jacob went in to get the blessings, after, again, disguised as Esau, and he took the blessings, his father gave him the blessings, uh, one thing that Isaac said about Jacob was, This, see the, um, the scent of my son is like the scent that a field has blessed. Rashi, the commentary, yeah, I'll explain again in a second. Uh, Rashi, the, com the famous classic commentary, Rashi explains that why was it that he scented that, that Isaac, Yitzhak, called a scent of the Garden of Eden, because that's where Jacob was. He was in the Garden of Eden. Later on, when Esau comes in, it says that, and uh, um, Isaac realized that this is actually his older son, Esau, he says he started to tremble violently and uh, tremble in fear. And Rashi again explains, because he sensed hell open below Esau. In other words, that basically Esau, Esau was in hell. So, what that means to say is, basically we carry our aura around with us wherever we go. If a person is in heaven, if he places the stones around his head and he meditates and contemplates godliness all around him, surrounding him, enveloping him in every possible way, that's when he's in the Garden of Eden, knowingly or unknowingly. Esau was the opposite. He thought primarily or exclusively about himself, about his own pleasures and about his own desires. And he wasn't averse to taking people's lives, to killing and to stealing and maiming and hurting and so on and so forth, as the Torah records. And therefore he was deep in hell. And he, and he took that with him. So when Jacob goes, he's leaving the Holy Land you might think, you would think that he's leaving his holiness, he's leaving the holiness behind, and now he's going into exile. But he goes through, he says, this is the gate of heaven, and in a sense, he's going through the gates. He's walking into heaven. As he leaves the land of Israel, as he leaves the holy land, he's taking the holy land with him in a sense. Yes, he's leaving the Holy Land, but he's taking it with him in the sense that that's where his mind, that's where his mind is, that's where his life is, that's where his, his being is. His being is in holiness. He steps through the gate means he's not stepping outside of the holiness, he's taking it with him. He's stepping into the Garden of Eden, so to speak, into Ghanaian, and he takes it with him. And therefore, we see that uh, eventually when he comes back, he indeed um, begins to rebuild the divine presence, so to speak, even in um, even before he comes back when he's when he's with love and he begins to re he begins to build the divine presence within the exile. How does he manage to do that? Because in a sense, he takes a little bit of the temple with him. So, what does this all mean to say? What this means to say is that wherever it is that we go, if we go in life with the attitude of Jacob, Yaakov, 
We're taking the permutations of God's name with us. We're putting them under our heads. We're keeping our heads in holiness. And therefore, wherever it is that we go, we have that protection. The angels will come. They'll protect us as necessary. As long as we do the good deeds that we send up, our good deeds, so to speak, we send them up to heaven. And we, and when, we, when I say good deeds, it doesn't only mean good deeds for ourselves. It means primarily good deeds for other people, towards other people, helping out other people, making other people's lives better. Because that's essentially what he did. Then, and only really then, can we feel that we're sort of taking heaven around with us. And the message that uh, Jacob comes to teach us is that wherever we go, even if it's into the darkness, even if it's into the uh, you know journey into darkness, I think that was a it's a title of a book as well, a classic Conrad Joseph Conrad, I think whatever. Yeah. So in any event, the um, journey into darkness, even in the darkness, you can carry your own light with you. Yes. That's right, yeah. When I go into the darkness, God is my light. That's exactly right. Yael just pointed out, I don't know if it's a private message or a message, but it says, uh, King David said, when I go, when I'm in the darkness, God is my light. In the darkness. So, even though we're in dark times, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we know that the times that we're living through are... Um, times of tremendous amount of, um, of, 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 uh, of darkness, of hiddenness, of concealment, of godliness, apparently terrible things happening in the world, etc. Keep your head straight. Be proud of who you are. Know that if you do the right thing, you have God with you, and things are going to work out. Um, However they happen, they always work out uh, for the best. And um, there's no need to fear. The place is awesome, but we don't have to fear that our, we don't have to fear that things are going to catch up with us in a negative way because we're confident in the fact that we're doing the right thing, we're helping people out, we're trying our best, we're doing good deeds, we're charitable people, and so on and so forth. And therefore, all of the darkness that's around us is there only to encourage us, to spur us on to a deeper search within ourselves for that fountain of goodness, of righteousness, of positivity, of, uh, of connection, connection to godliness and therefore wherever we are we take that sort of the tent of holiness around us and with us until eventually it becomes a permanent structure uh, in which we will all be able to uh, to worship um, I would like to leave some time for questions today and I don't have to be questions of um, on what we just learned they could be questions uh, about anything I know that uh, there are several I've had several emails about people who are kind of nervous about what's going on right now. Um, and so if anyone wants to ask anything in this particular regard, you are welcome. I'm going to stop recording.